So good morning. My name is Murray, one of the elders here at Grace Fellowship. It's a pleasure to gather together. Um, uh, we do have an announcement to make this, especially for those of you watching on live stream, that we're only doing the live stream to the end of the month, so there'll be three more sessions at this time. We'll still be videoing, recording that, so you can still watch it later in the afternoon. It just won't be available at the 10, 15 time. Well, today we're wrapping up the series that we've been in, Habakkuk, and really it's been this, this short uh, book, but it's been a valuable journey for us, I think, um, for me, for sure, because life is not neat and tidy all the time, and clearly we're not in charge. So the book really began with Habakkuk lamenting, he's crying out to God because the people of God were really disregarding the ways of God. In fact, they were treating one another with injustice and contempt. And God just seems to be absent as far as Habakkuk is concerned. Like, is it even, should he even bother praying? Because is it going to make any difference anyway? And now, usually we see a prophet speaking on behalf of God to the people. But here in Habakkuk, we actually get to see the uh, prophet uh, really speaking on behalf of the people to God. And really, he's asking the how long question, you know, so it's not just kids on a trip that ask you that question. Uh, here, Habakkuk asks God, you know, how long do we have to, how long is this going to go on? How long do we have to endure this? And he asks the why question, right? So in light of all the, the evil, the injustice, <clears throat> the suffering, just why? And he wants to know, does God even hear his cries? You know, does God even care at all? And so God put this in the Bible because it's not only Habakkuk who can feel that way, because sometimes we do as well, right? And God needs to know, he wants us to know that he actually knows and that he is gracious towards our doubts and our fears and our struggles. And so in grace, God comes and he actually responds to Habakkuk and then through him to us. And I'm thinking that as Habakkuk was actually praying, he was really hoping that God would bring about a revival, such as happened in the days of Josiah just a generation or so earlier. But God's answer to him is not so neatly packaged. In fact, God tells Habakkuk that not only has he heard his prayer, but he's actually answering it. And he's answering it by raising up what group of people? Or the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, right? The Babylonian Empire, as they're called in chapter one, that hasty and bitter and evil nation. And they're going to bring judgment on the people of Israel. So now Habakkuk kind of feels like he just got sucker punched by Mike Tyson, right? So as he's still staggering around a little bit, rocked his world, he just kind of goes, well, isn't there a plan B? Like, maybe plan B would sound a little better than that. But as we learn from this book, God actually does things in ways that cause us to be, shall we say, stretched. He's not a predictable God. He doesn't always just fit neatly into our human understanding and reasoning. And so that leads to Habakkuk's second question that comes out of his confusion. How can you do that? Right? Right? I mean, I thought we were your people. I thought you had wanted to bless us. I, I thought you were a holy God, right? Who wouldn't certainly have anything to do with wretched, evil sinners like the Chaldeans. How can you actually use a wicked people to judge a less wicked people, right? In his estimation. And how can you let those who have been so evil and, and have oppressed people and gotten rich and powerful, how can you just let them get more rich off of us? He just can't see how anything good could come out of this situation. But just because we can't see any good reason doesn't mean that there isn't a very good reason that we might not be able to see, we might not have thought of, or might not be able to comprehend. Because if we think, just because I can't think of a reasonable answer, therefore there can't be one, if that's the case, then I'm declaring... I obviously am as smart as or smarter than God. So God tells Habakkuk, I will use the Babylonians and then I'll punish them because they are terribly wicked. 
I've already pronounced woe on them. But before that day of woe comes, I will use them for my purposes. And he tells Habakkuk then, in light of who you are, and in light of who you know I am, and in light of what I've revealed to you about my redeeming love, would you have faith in me? See, we can easily fall into the trap that Habakkuk did very early on. When he started to focus on the the Babylonians and how sinful they were and their evil, right? Then he was able to start making actually light of his own sin and pride or maybe even ignore it altogether. But that ends pretty quick in chapter 2, right? When God calls down woe on all pride, on all unbelief and selfishness and idolatry. And all of us are part of the problem. And as Jordan showed us last week, we too need a hero to deliver us. And he's not wearing a red and white toque. So the Bible's not good guys and bad guys. It's bad guys and Jesus. And now when we get to chapter three, right, it's a song. It's a song, really, it's Habakkuk's prayer, really put in uh, as a song, just marveling at the wisdom and the plan of the sovereign Lord, whose thoughts and ways are just way above ours. And Habakkuk declares, okay, God, you've said it. You said for sure you're going to do it, so I believe that this terrible time of judgment is coming. And so he prays then early on in this song, so Lord, in your wrath, would you remember mercy? Please remember mercy. That's his prayer. And then he closes his song with this beautiful declaration of submission. And submission is just beautiful. There is no one submissive like Jesus who in joyful love just submits himself completely to the will of his Father in absolute trust. And in this submission of faith, Habakkuk provides a foreshadowing and really a picture of Jesus, which gives us really great reason to rejoice. So let's have our scripture. If you've got your Bible, your app, if you just want to turn to Habakkuk chapter 3, the very end of this little book. And so Habakkuk's right near the very end of the Old Testament. So if you can find Matthew in the New Testament, just flip a few pages to the left. Slowly, because it's not a very long book, you could go right over top of it. But Habakkuk chapter 3, then verses 17 to 19. Reading from Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, The produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. To the choir master with stringed instruments. If you want a good little passage to memorize that you'll find very relevant and practical, this is a great little section to commit to memory so you can take it with you as you need, and you will need it at different times. Now in verse 17, then where he starts here at the end of this song, he mentions six things that are going to take place when the Chaldeans come uh, then and really take over. And so he says in verse 17, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines. The produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Now figs, that's where he starts off. Figs were a delicacy in Israel. I mean, if God told me, no more figs, I think I could live with it. Yeah, I'd handle that one pretty good. Trouble is, it doesn't stop with the figs. It actually gets more inconvenient. It moves on to no grapes to failure of the fields and crops, right? To the livestock. So, so the loss of any one of these things might be, you know, inconvenient, but to lose them all, like that's devastating. That's like economic disaster. That's loss of hope. That's having no daily provision. And then by the, by the end of verse 17, you know, this is just not a bad harvest, 
right? This description is something that's desperate and devastating. Yet he says in verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. So yet it's such an inspiring uh, word in light of verse 17. And notice it's not joy from God, but it's joy in him. So Habakkuk actually comes to the place where he can sing, right? Let the worst come. I'll remain faithful to the God of my salvation. If I lose everything in this world that I have typically tied to my joy, I have the Lord who himself is my ultimate joy and salvation. And so he's not a guy just reluctantly kind of, oh, you know, resigning. He's not even just saying, okay, suck it up, suck it up. No, this is Habakkuk saying, I will be joyful and rejoice in my God. So we got to go, how? I mean, how does he do that? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not exactly, my first reaction is not actually to be inspired by what I see here in Habakkuk. I'm actually crushed by it. You know, come on, everyone, let's be like Habakkuk. And I'm thinking, that's a nice thought. But when the rubber actually hits the road, how often is that me? How often is that you? Right? We grumble and complain. We come to the end of our patience in far less devastating scenarios than Habakkuk about to experience, right? Or is it just me? You know? Sometimes our life just has no fig moments. But at other times, we have no herd in the stall moments. Now, for most of us, we actually live, we actually try to order our lives and structure things in such a way that we never have to encounter discomfort or hardships. But here's the thing. They still come. So how do we get from the though to the yet. How do we get from verse 17 to verse 18? How does Habakkuk actually get from all his doubts and confusion, his questions in the midst of, of all this suffering and hardship to a place of rejoicing? Because something's changed in Habakkuk. Something's changed in verses 18 and 19 because this wasn't his go-to response back in chapters 1 and 2. He wasn't singing and praising back then. So I think the first thing, there's several things I think that happen. We won't mention them all, but I think there's a couple big ones that I think we can recognize. One thing truly that made a difference for Habakkuk is he, that he truly knew God. He knew him in a relationship way. He moves from his chapter one knowing to now this end of chapter three knowing. In chapter one, he had some good theology he had good head knowledge. He just couldn't fit his theology and make it fit with what he was actually seeing and experiencing. But now in chapter 3, his head knowledge is actually making a difference in his heart. God had actually become bigger now in his understanding than just a few sprinkles of blessings and a happy, comfortable life. So this stretching time that Habakkuk's gone through, it's led him actually to intimacy with God, which most hard things will always do. You're either going to run to God in that time or you're going to turn away from him. But this God who had condescended to speak to him, to come to him, to not blow him off, who actually graciously comes to, to reveal himself and things to his doubting prophet. But if you only know a about God, if you just know him intellectually, right? If he's just a concept to you, or if he's sort of just um, a philosophical idea and things that you like to think about, then you won't get from even though to yet. Because yet only comes in a real intimate relationship of love and trust, right? Where he's already told Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith in Jesus. Faith in the Bible then is always used in a relationship way. See, we, don't, we tend to use believe and we tend to mean intellectually and convince something is true or not true. We use it in that intellectually concept way, but the Bible doesn't. 
The Bible, when it talks about faith and believing, it's talking about faith, believing into, into a relationship of trust and love. It's the relationship word. John 17, 3, in fact, tells us that true salvation is knowing God. That's knowing him in this intimate relationship way. And Jesus Christ, whom he sent, in fact, salvation is the way to God. Salvation is not the end. I think a lot of people get confused. They talk about, well, getting saved. Are you saved? As if salvation is an end point. But Jesus died to bring us to God. God is the end. So you will not get to the yet of verse 18 unless you're truly born from above by work of the Spirit so that you actually know and value the grace and love of of Jesus. And then secondly, God was actually enough for Habakkuk. Now definitely Habakkuk was a work in progress, just like we are, right? But, but he got to this place, and it wasn't simply a cerebral understanding. Habakkuk at the end here enjoyed God more than just enjoying what God could give him. Strip everything else away. If we still have God, is that enough? Like, are you in this relationship with God for prosperity, health, success, comfort, ease? Or are you in this relationship to get God? Do you talk about going to heaven? Right? Is that what you're after? Or is your focus being with God? We get to be with Jesus and see him face to face. That's a good question for all of us. Is God enough for us? And you see, it's only when we're thinking right. Trouble is we're not always thinking right, right? But when we see the big picture, when we actually have this eternal perspective, when we really get who we are and we really get who God is, right? When we're thinking right, we can then know God actually is enough. So how does Habakkuk get to the place where he is thinking right, where he is that at the end of this, this little book in chapter 3? Well, he gets to this place. One thing I see right in the text, he gets this place by repeating and remembering. You'll notice the repetition. I mean, he just went through it in the song. He's just repeating a whole lot of things that he knew. And then even in verse 18, he says, right, I rejoice. And he repeats it, I will rejoice, right? And so if we're going to get to the place of truly finding our joy in God, in rejoicing in him despite our circumstances, then we need to have a place in our lives. We need these rhythms that are going to bring us consistently and constantly in contact with God, such as praying to him regularly throughout the day, hearing what he proclaims in his word regularly, both when we're alone and in, and in community, so that we can behold Jesus, that we actually can gaze upon his beauty, soak in the wonder of his love and his amazing grace that he showed us in the gospel, such as we do at this regular gathering, right? Every week, without fail, we can have this consistent rhythm then. And then we come together in smaller gospel communities as Don and Donna uh, do and, and told us, right, for that repeated encouragement, and then we take opportunities to grow deeper in our theology, right? In our knowledge of God. So it has something, as in our video we watched earlier, to, to light on fire. And that's why we try to provide this for you in our training classes, in our interactive Bible seminars, right? So that our theology would just light our hearts on fire. And we'd be thinking and viewing things rightly. God created us creatures who function through habit. For better or for worse, we function by habit, right? So we get to the place that Habakkuk is in where Jesus is actually enough through repeating the means of grace that God has actually given us so that we can better know and love and enjoy him. And that's why I'll be back here next week. And the week after that. And the week after that. And it doesn't matter whether I'm preaching or serving or not. Right? 
you, I'm here because I'm fighting for my joy in the God of my salvation. That's what you should be doing here right now in the seat. You should be fighting for your joy. I need the constant refrain of the gospel so that in my heart and mind, the, all that fog of distortion and deception is just blowing away so I get once again a clear vision of the value and treasure of what I actually have in Jesus so that I can think rightly. So rejoicing is not simply a description of the feelings you have. It's actually a choice to posture your heart to what you know to be true, even when you don't feel it. See, your feelings don't have brains. You ever notice that? You actually have to tell them what, what and how to feel. Now, I know you can't just simply command yourself to be happy. But what you can do is explain to yourself why you should be happy. Second thing is remember. Remember all that he has done for you, especially in Jesus. So all the repetition, all that hab habitual rhythms in your life is for the sake of remembering. Habakkuk rehearses in his mind. He's thinking about all that God is, all his attributes, his holiness, his grace, his sovereignty, right, as a redeeming God. He does that all through the earlier verses of this song. He's not making a list of petitions in his prayer, right, but he's doing a whole lot of remembering and a whole lot of praising God for who he is. And he gets all this information from the scriptures. His relationship just flows out of God's revelation of himself. In fact, the next verse, verse 19, at the very end of this song, actually comes from Psalm 18. As a lot of the allusions that he writes earlier in the song. And so Psalm 18 for sure was one of the inspirations for his song that he sings and for these verses. See, without viewing or filtering life and our experience through the lens of the scriptures, you won't be in a place of rejoicing in the God of our salvation. No wonder the enemy really wants to keep us from the scripture. Well, let's look at this verse 19, which comes out of Psalm 18. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. He says, so the Lord is my strength, he says. And you see, when bad circumstances come, right, when things start coming at you, right, it can zap our strength, right? It just weakens and deflates us, right? We're all excited about something. All of a sudden, this happens, this happens, this happens, and we're just deflated, right, like that balloon, Right? But the Lord died for me to renew my strength. Have you ever been in the mountains? Maybe you've seen deer, seen mountain sheep. And you look and you go, and you go how did they ever get up there? Like, how did they get up there? Well, these mountain deer are, are nimble and they can move across places that, man, if I was trying to walk across that same mountain face, I'd be struggling, I'd be slipping, you know, I'd be just grasping for things. Well, in Jesus, in the gospel, God makes me sure-footed in the rocky, dangerous, and treacherous, and slippery places so that I will not ultimately fall. So I keep growing in my faith in Jesus to get to the high places where actually I have this big picture view. You see, from the high places, you've got a different view of things, don't you? Right? It changes your perspective. From this high vantage point, you can actually see, you can look back and see where you've come from. You can see that time you thought you were winding backwards. Oh, but they're still on the path. They're still getting there. And you can look ahead and see where you're going. 
And you just have this vantage point of a whole different perspective that sees the whole picture, right? So you can see your, your destination. It's just more a complete view. So if I look back, wow, I can just see how his grace, how far his grace has brought me and through what trials and troubles I've already come. I can see those things as I look back. And if I look back far enough, I can actually see a cross where my sins are forgiven, paid in full so there's no condemnation for me. I see that from the heights. And looking ahead, to use Pilgrim's Progress thing, I can see the celestial city. And Jesus is coming to bring about the fullness of his kingdom. And I'm going to get a new body. I'm going to be resurrected. And I'm going to live in a restored earth with Jesus who has fully loved me and loved me to the end. You know, communion that we're going to take a little bit later, it's a high place. You catch that parallel? When we come and break bread together, we're focusing on past, present, and future. So communion is a place where we, we approach and climb the high places to get that perspective. Now the context of Psalm 18 from which this verse comes, it's trusting God in difficult times. It's actually a psalm of David. It's, it's written on the day that the Lord had delivered him from the hand of Saul. Listen how it starts in Psalm 18. First words right out of the gate. I love you. I love you, O Lord. That's Yahweh, all capitals, right? My strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. What do you notice? What's a repeated word there? My. Right, it's repeated like nine times. My, my strength. My rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, right? My shield, my salvation, my stronghold. God is his and he is God's. The possessive my is emphasized. God is for him. He belongs to the Lord and the Lord to him. This is covenant relationship. It starts with love, right? I love you, Yahweh, the I am. The I am is my Lord. He's not just the self-existing, all-powerful, sovereign God. He is mine and I am his. Some of you might be ready just to, to pack it up, maybe blaming God. You know, this whole Christian life thing, right? This whole church deal. And some of you are going through hard things and it's not just fig level. It's no herd in the stalls, no crops in the field level. And God seems idle. He seems absent. He's distant. He's stretching you. For Habakkuk, God was known. And God was enough. And that God was his. And that got Habakkuk from though to yet. John Riesinger, a friend, used to say, that we should look at life when the dark times come like a little league baseball player he knew. And he tells a story about a man came along, he saw a boy, there's a baseball game going on, so he leans over the fence and just calls up to one of the boys, say, hey, what's the score? The boy says, 40 to nothing. Who's winning? The boy said, the other team. Oh, so the man, you know, he's trying to be sympathetic. You know, ah, oh, you must be very discouraged. The little boy's face just never stopped lighting up. And he just said, oh, no, we're not discouraged. We haven't even come up to bat yet. <laughs> See, it doesn't matter to the Christian what the scoreboard says now. It doesn't matter what you read on that scoreboard. We're on the winning team. And we're going to be celebrating in the dressing room when the fat lady sings. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> 
Jesus is Lord. And everything in the end will be for our good and the glory of God. Wicked hands crucified our Lord. But the scars in his hands don't signify his defeat, actually testify of his great victory, in which we live and in which we die. And never has God been more triumphant in his power, love, and holiness than he was that day of violent injustice on Mount Calvary. So let's not judge the love and goodness and wisdom of God by our circumstances and our feeble sight. Let's judge the love and goodness of our God by the cross. And every step we take in the world today, during even the roughest patches of life, we can find secure footing, like a deer in the rocky high places on the foundation of Mount Calvary. Because it's in Mount Calvary, we actually have the highest vantage point to see the big picture. And we will not ultimately fall. God has a plan. It's unchangeable. And God's plan will succeed. And his plan includes all things that come to pass. Yes, even COVID and governments and Babylonian empires and suffering and injustice for a time. And the day is coming when we will see Jesus face to face. And he'll share with us how all things were working together for the best possible end. And that's a great cause for rejoicing, even though. Wait a minute. What's the deal with that little add-on at the end? To the choir master with stringed instruments. See, we have to remember that this whole chapter, chapter three, is a song. And here we have direction to the song leader. And what's the direction? We don't want a cappella, right? Bring out the instruments. Bring out the guitars. Bad day to have no guitars. <laughs> so if some of you can play guitar, you got it. We need you to pull it out here for these last songs, right? And we, and we want to put, in those, put some good music to this. This is a prayer, but I want you to put some good music to it so we can sing it and repeat it. And we want to repeat it over and over so we can remember and then we can sing these truths throughout our day and on throughout generations. So this is a small book that began with a protest, but it ends with praise. What God revealed he would do, even using injustice and evil to bring about good and a great salvation. He would even use an instrument of torture designed by the evil and bitter and cruel Babylonians, a cross, crucifixion, that they meant for evil, but God designed for our salvation. So this instruction at the very end is given to the, the choir master, the song leader, meaning it's to be sung as a congregation, as a community of God worshipers. It's meant to be sung together. Sometimes to get from though to yet is to gather in community and sing praises to God, to sing words of truth for the sake of one another so that the truth of the gospel would be able to pierce our hardened and doubtful and cold hearts and then settle in there. Even though we're tempted to isolate, even though we don't feel like being with people, even though we're in a dark place and it seems like too much trouble to make it downtown here to gather, even though we're tempted to, to blame God, and depart from the people, the very people of God that he's gifted to us. We need to come together. We need to sing the truth of God's goodness, his character, his great plan that centered on Jesus. And then our singing in the gathered assembly, we recognize is not just vertical. It's not just for God's sake. But it's also horizontal. 
And both the letters of Colossians and Ephesians say that. It says addressing one another, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, sometimes you can't even sing. But being here, just listening to these words as the rest of the church sings, the Spirit can use that. And the Spirit can push that truth into your hearts that once again can start to beat and be awakened. I remember when we didn't think our first grandchild was going to live. And he was in NICU at RUH. And it was Saturday night. And I couldn't sleep at all that night. And I just prayed off and on throughout this sleepless night. The morning, I was just bagged out. I was thankful I wasn't scheduled to preach that day. So what did we do? Even though we needed to be here with you. We needed to worship and praise our God. We needed to be reminded over and over. We needed to have something repeated to us. We needed to remember so that we could praise our God and rejoice in him. We needed some guitars, even though yet. So I was here probably right about where, somewhere between where Kurt and Scott were, and I sang. And I raised my hands in an attempt to just awaken my unbelieving and aching heart, tears streaming down my face, and I rejoiced in God my Savior, even though. And not only did I trust he was sovereign, I was so glad he was sovereign because who else would you want to be? And it was one of the richest moments of really intimacy with my Lord that I ever had. I felt like a mountain deer, not slipping, but actually ascending to the heights where I could see all the way back to the cross and be convinced of his love and his wisdom, and what he could do. And I could see all the way forward to the resurrection and the return of Jesus. What a view it was. What a view. See, I don't want to just be here and praise him when things are good. But I praise him because he is good. And I need to be here to repeat and to remember, especially when I'm tired and when I'm struggling, and when I'm hurting, especially when I don't feel like being here, and my feet don't even want to climb out of bed, let alone ascend some heights. I look to Jesus, who is my salvation. I see him dying on the tree for me. And then I look down at my feet, and yeah, I see them. Deer's feet. Deer's feet. So I climb out of bed and I find my way here to you. To be with you, the people who know and love Jesus. This temple of living stones that God, as Habakkuk has said earlier, that God is in his holy temple. And I know I'll meet with God here and experience him. Because I need the embrace of his presence that I get through you. See, the fig tree may not blossom, but there's a rose of Sharon on another tree. And he's provided my salvation. And he has satisfied my hunger and thirst like no fig ever could. And he is the one true vine. And the fruit of his life was cut off and crushed so that I could be grafted into the vine. And though I have no flock in the field, the only lamb I need died for me that I might live. So God's not telling us to be like Habakkuk, but to set our eyes and heart 
on the one to whom Habakkuk points to. When I see Habakkuk standing there and just rejoicing and trusting in God, when everything's been taken away from him, when I see it just as an example, it crushes me. But when I look to the one to whom he points, when I look to the one he's so excited about, when I look to the one that's given his heart such comfort and security, the one in whom he found his joy, in the one who had everything taken from him. You know, when Jesus got to the end of his life, he only had one possession, his robe. And that too was taken away. And he was stripped naked and then he was nailed on a cross. Do you know what we have in the Lord Jesus? <laughs> well, he was someone who had, he had no bank account. He was wiped out. He had nothing in his pocket. He didn't even have pockets. Everything he had was taken from him. And yet, on the cross, Jesus did not say, I'm not getting anything out of this relationship. I'm out of here. On the cross, he's rejoicing and trusting in God, his Father, though everything's been taken away from him. And why did he do it? Because he did it for you and for me. See, that's the secret. That's why we can live like Habakkuk is suggesting we live like. Psalm 1611, one of my favorite psalms and it says this at the end you make known to me the path of life there's the way there's the way to the heights in your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore what are those pleasures forevermore right what's it what's at the father's right hand are those pleasures things? Are those pleasures a place called heaven? It's a person. Over and over, there's a repeated refrain in the New Testament at what's at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. All those pleasures are bound up in the risen Jesus. Jesus. Our pleasures, Jesus, the right hand of the Father, that's our pleasure, that's our joy, a joy that cannot be ultimately taken away or removed. In fact, in verse 18, if you notice this, we just look back at it, it says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. See, the all capitals, that means it's the word Yahweh, right, the I am. And then he says, I will take joy in the God of my salvation, so the, the Lord, that's Yahweh, the God of my salvation. You put those two names together, and what do you have? It makes what name? It makes the name Jesus. You know what Jesus is? It's the name for Yah from Yahweh, and Yahweh is my salvation. God is my salvation. You mash those together, let's do a mashup. It's Jesus. It's the literal meaning of Jesus. So keep looking to Jesus, right? Yahweh is my salvation. That's what Jesus' name means. He's the author and finisher of our faith. So our joy is found in being loved by him, being accepted by him, belonging to him, enjoying to him, and that will keep your footing as you ascend the mountain like a deer to the heights where we can gaze on God and his wonderful works, past, present, and future, until your heart sings. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being who you are, that you are both holy and just and gracious and merciful and just all that you are just comes together in full brightness and glory as we behold Jesus on the cross in our place. What a cause for joy. And we are in him. You see us in him. We are treated 
<laughs> like you treat Jesus. You love us like you love Jesus, and that will never change. Our circumstances, wow, they're, they're shifting sand. They're, they're changing all the time. We get hit and we get sideswiped pretty quick. Things are going well. One thing happens, bang, our feet's taken out from under us. But Lord, let us set our eyes once again on Jesus. The fullness of the salvation he's won for us that brings us to you as our Father. We can call you Abba. What value, what a treasure can that be? What, what could you buy that is worth more than that? That we know you, God, as our Father, now and forever. And that can never change because Jesus did it all. And that's good news. That no matter what happens, that even though things are going <laughs> to happen and things are going to go off, Lord, yet we can rejoice in you. We can rejoice in you, the God of our salvation. So, as Psalm 18 started, we love you, Jesus. We love you. It's in his name I pray. Amen.